Well, good morning. I'd like to uh, say hello to everybody, all my friends here. We're going to be talking this morning about uh, current and emerging trends in imaging and robotics. Uh, we're not quite to the stage yet where uh, we're going to be doing autonomous robotic surgery on aliens, like in the movie Prometheus, but hopefully someday soon we'll be getting close. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for the ability to come here uh, today. Obviously, uh, my good friends, uh, all of you are here looking at me right now. I wish I could be there in person, and hopefully next time I will be. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, some of which are relevant to this talk. I think the biggest change in neurosurgery and, and in spine surgery was the advent of image-guided surgery back in the 1980s. This is Watanabe utilizing uh, frameless stereotaxy. I think this changed everything for us in surgery because it, it, gave, it gave us the ability to understand where we were in three-dimensional space. And uh, that image-guided spinal surgery, it wasn't long before we started doing this in the spine. This is a case of mine about 15 years ago. Uh, where we were putting K-wires in, utilizing image guidance. And then the reality was that we're, I noticed that we're all looking away from the patient, looking at the screen, trying to understand where we were in three dimensions, but our attention shifted. Why would we use image guidance? Well, we all want accuracy and precision. That's what we're all looking for in spinal surgery, being able to reproduce, uh, hitting that target every single time. When we look at our experience, and this is from Johns Hopkins, the 6,800 freehand pedicle screws, there's about a 9% breach rate uh, with a 0.8% reoperation rate. And these are very skilled surgeons. This was done before I got to Hopkins with Ollie Biden and Shubo, Gokaslin, Walensky with them. And the reality is that uh, while most of the screws that were misplaced were not harmful to the patient, the, the issue is, could we do better? Can we can we decrease that uh, miss rate? When we start looking at utilizing technology, we, real, we realize that freehand accuracy is about 68%. We start adding fluoro, we get up into 80%. Then we start using 3D navigation, we get into the high 90s. So there's definitely an incremental improvement as we use enabling technologies uh, uh, to help us. What happens and why didn't this take off? And the reality is that Roger Hartle wrote a beautiful article a few years ago, and it turns out that the main reason was workflow. When surgeons felt that they were not able to um, have a reliable uh, technology that fit into the workflow, it didn't, didn't happen, and people abandoned utilizing image guidance. We're now at a really golden era where we have advancements in imaging, advancements in robotics, and advancements in surgery. We bring those together with image-guided surgery and now with surgical robotics like the DaVinci and other platforms, and now we have this ability to bring everything together with image-guided surgical robotics, uh, bringing to bear all of these technologies really to help us uh, care for our patients. When we talk about automation and surgery. This is my, one of my favorites. This is the Fyodorov Institute in Russia, 1980. And uh, Fyodorov was doing radio care autonomy. And the fact of the matter is that instead of going from room to room, he was able to do this reliably uh, by moving the patient to him. And how do we automate what we do to help make what we do easier and better for our patients? This really started in the 80s here at Hopkins. This is Russ Taylor, a colleague of mine, who's really the, the father, grandfather, if you will, of medical robotics. This is RoboDoc, the first uh, robot for coring the femoral shaft. Aesop Robot was a robot that used to hold endoscopes. And one of my mentors, Curtis Dickman, really was the first to introduce this in spine surgery. When we were doing thoracoscopic surgery, uh, we introduced the Aesop Robot to hold the thoracoscope for us in surgery. So this really was the first time a robot was used in spinal surgery. And when I put this together in 2002 for Volker Sontag, my mentor, the fact of the matter is that nobody really understood what a robot would look like in spinal surgery. I had this sort of pie in the sky view that it would be fully autonomous. And then you had to realize that mm, the FDA is going to have something to say about that. But why would we use robotics? What's, what's the whole, you know, impetus behind this type of technology. Obviously, we want patients are looking for less invasive surgery. We are looking to do less invasive surgery. We want to reduce our radiation exposure. We also want procedural consistency. We want to be able to hit the target every time. And then we want to 
plan. We want to be able to understand how things are going to look at the time of surgery. We can do that now with these enabling technologies. This is my first foray over 20 years ago in Phoenix of what it would look like taking a robotic arm and targeting the pedicle. And this is Neil Crawford, a uh, biomedical engineer, my partner and the founder of Excelsior Surgical. We ultimately were able to build a prototype of what we thought would be a surgical robot, the first fully image-guided uh, surgical robot, and then bringing that into play with image guidance that we had the ability to navigate at the time of surgery and have a robotic arm take us reliably to the trajectory that we want. Being able to place that robot in the field such that it doesn't interfere with anything. This is an important design consideration. What is the footprint of the device? Where does your assistant sit? All of these things needed to be taken into account. Having it on wheels has been great because we can put our screws in or do our surgery and then it wheels out to the next case. We also wanted real-time feedback. People ask me all the time, uh, is there tactile feedback with robotic surgery? And the, action, the answer is yes. We have now feedback looking at force monitoring, movement of devices, and you're able to feel the screw go in, you're able to feel it go into bone, and the, the reality is you, you're still the surgeon. So we do have tactile feedback. In 2017, August, we got FDA approval for the device and then ultimately did our first case on October 4th, 2017. And you can see we did an open case here. Um, the reality is this, we have not looked back uh, since this time. What does robotic and enabling technology allow you to do? It allows you to plan. So not just on the fly, but you're able to really plan out what a surgery will look like in advance of doing that procedure. How big is the screw going to be? Uh, how long is the screw going to be, et cetera. And we're able to do this now very quickly, but it does lend us to putting in larger and longer screws than we normally would. Bringing the robot into the field and again, uh, setting it up such that it doesn't really interfere with your assistance with anesthesia and understanding how that works. And, and the workflow is a little bit different in every place you go. And then placing screws. The neat thing is you're able to mark the skin and literally uh, for an MIST lift now, we're able to mark the skin, make incisions, and place pedicle screws within about the first three to four minutes of the procedure. Honestly, that I could never imagine that being done uh, any faster and under any other paradigm uh, than with a robot. I will show you now some cases that we've done over the past couple of years. This is a 41-year-old woman with a progressive uh, thoracic deformity, secondary to osteomyelitis. And the reality is she came in with spinal cord compression. Again, this is a, you know not an uncommon procedure. The, the fact of the matter is you know, be, being able to not just put the screws in, but to navigate, allowing us to understand where uh, the, the dura is, where the ventral aspect of the vertebral body is to help us reconstruct the spine is very valuable. Having that feedback has been great. This is a case of a young woman with a tethered cord, and we published a large series on this with significant, uh, you can see, stretching of the spinal cord, progressive symptoms. She's had six prior operations before. One of the things that we're doing now is vertebral column resection, usually at the level of T12, and shortening this patient by about 22 to 24 millimeters. And in doing so, we take that tension off the spinal cord. Interestingly enough, a lot of these patients... Um, you know, have multiple spinal problems, but thinking that through and how we get this patient reconstructed, you can see here, it's a large operation. Placing the pedicle screws with robotics has been great. And then utilizing image guidance to watch our corpectomy uh, in real time uh, as we resect T12, uh, about 50 or 60% of that body is in the T11, 12 disc space prior to doing the shortening. These are the patients though, it can be challenging. These are the patients with very small pedicles, as you can see here, being able to reconstruct the spine, uh, utilizing image guidance for robotics has been a big boon for this. You can see the reconstruction here. This is a, a large individual, BMI 50, a taxi driver in Phoenix who had a, or excuse me, in, in Baltimore, my mind is wandering, uh, who had a fractured dislocation after his own taxi ran him over, long story. But again, you know, throwing in this, my anesthesiologist, well, he's also a Jehovah's Witness. How do you reconstruct the spine without losing any blood and somebody with a BMI of 50? Again, we can do this percutaneously with the robot in about 45 uh, minutes to an hour, uh, have the, the spine instrumented with very little blood loss. This is a patient who uh, fell from a ladder and 
you know, actually came in with two injuries, had an L1 burst fracture and also a traumatic spondylolisthesis at L5-S1 with an acute foot drop, oddly enough. So in two problems here, you can see the uh, fracture up at L1 and also the, the acute spondylolisthesis with worsening. Treat this as two procedures. So we did a T12 to L2 uh, percutaneous fixation fixation of the, the burst fracture, and then also a TLF at L5-S1. And again, not having to do a major long construct, treated this as two MIS procedures, reconstructing his spine, and then doing the TLF, uh, placing an expanded lunar body, and then getting him pulled back into alignment. This is a uh, 58-year-old gentleman with an atypical hemangioma, and these are unusual uh, lesions. This patient was presenting with some radiculopathy and a mild myelopathy, and um, these are very treacherous lesions as obviously they, they, they bleed tremendously. What are your treatment options? Well, in this case, we decided to uh, fixate him percutaneously and then cannulate the pedicle uh, with the robot. And in doing so, we were able to intraoperatively, along with my endovascular colleague, uh, perform an embolization uh, of uh, the affected body here with onyx. Uh, take care of that. And also that that intradural portion sort of melts away. And a really nice way to do this in about two hours with almost no blood loss. Uh, again, utilizing image guidance uh, for our fixation and also cannulation of the pedicle. This is another individual just came in about a year ago, a, sur a body surfer uh, from the Eastern Shore, bilateral uh, traumatic parse fracture, hangman's fracture, you know, with spinal stenosis, a mild central cord syndrome, it needs a decompression. But again, what can we do differently? Utilizing enabling technology, we're able to not just do what we would normally do, which would be a C1 to C4 fusion, but cannulate across that fracture segment. And with the robot, being able to do a direct PARS repair at C2. Uh, again, putting screws in across that and fixating. Um, there are now obviously cranial applications with robotics as well placing deep brain electrodes, uh, serotactic electrodes for um, epilepsy and also brain biopsy and things like that are now being done with the same type of robotic platform enabling technology. We have a different way of looking at accuracy. We are able to ultimately, are we in the pedicle or not? We can do better than that right now because we can actually look to see how we perform plan over uh, where the screws are placed. This is our first foray into that. And you can see D, F, G, there was some skiving of the drill. We were able to look at that and, and figure out what our drill technique was, change that, and then ultimately come up with a paradigm now where we're looking at volumetric analysis. And, uh, you know, our most recent series, which was published, putting us in the 98 to 99% uh, accuracy range, utilizing robotics uh, for screw placement. There is a learning curve associated with this, and the reality is that uh, with that learning curve, Obviously, you know, it takes time. So we look at our first 28 cases matched with controls. We saw less blood loss, less length of stay. We were able to collapse the procedure time by about four and a half minutes a case. And you can see this ultimately bringing down the, the, the case for a single level MIST lift from three or four hours at the beginning now to reliably done in less than two hours. And that's now uh, sort of our standard. And this now we've seen across platforms and across surgeons. We see proficiency is reached at about 20 cases. Uh, you know, you become proficient with robot robotic technology. And then really mastery is achieved at the 61st case. So it takes about 60 cases. And there's a learning curve associated with everything we do in surgery and robotics is no different. When we look at who's using this technology, all of my residents, the millennials, have embraced this without any question at all. They realize that this gives them confidence, makes them faster and better. We do need to teach surgery, though, in the paradigm of what happens if something happens, if the technology doesn't work that we want it to in troubleshooting it. But just as a, a, we don't do any open gallbladders anymore, I don't see, think we're going to be doing open pedicle screw fixations in the future. The reality is teaching the next gener generation of surgeons how to be, be surgeons. Right now, there's going to be interoperability of all of these devices, you know, as we bring everything together with robotics and imaging and little, utilizing all these various imaging th technologies has really been exciting to see how we use intraoperative imaging with robotics to really even further streamline uh, the workflow. One of the other technologies I'm very excited about is MRI to CT or synthetic CT. We've been working with a company called MRI Guidance out of the Netherlands. What you see on the left here is an MRI scan reconstructed uh, into a CT scan. So that what you see, it says bone MRI on the left is actually a CT scan. 
So the synthetic CT is on the left, on the right side is a real CT. And what we did was take a cadaver, got an MRI scan, converted it into a synthetic CT, took a real CT, and then ultimately planned pedicle screws left and right side, instrumented the entire spine from top to bottom, utilizing on one side a true CT, comb, uh, true uh, three-dimensional CT scan, on the other side a reconstruction utilizing MRI. And ultimately we found there was absolutely no difference whatsoever, 99% accuracy rate with both modalities. So to argue that in the very near future, CT scan may become obviated and we may not need a CT scan. We might be able to use MRI scan and convert that into a CT uh, for navigation. So look forward to seeing that in the very near future. Ultimately, what we started off with in robotics were very, very simple operations, degenerative cases, trauma, MIS. We're now expanding that portfolio. We're looking at more complicated uh, problems. We're doing direct lateral. We're doing prone lateral. We're doing tumor resection, osteotomies, utilizing image guidance and robotics. This is in the lab in Baltimore where we are taking a UR5 robot, doing laminectomies, and we are capturing this motion. And then ultimately with image guidance, training the robot now to be able to actually do surgery. So having the robot come in and help us make osteotomy cuts is something that will happen in our lifetimes. And I will argue that that will be sometime in the next, you know, two to three years, you'll see this start coming out. Autonomous surgery completely is a way off in the future. This is Axel Krieger from Hopkins. When you have cameras involved and are able to then use that to help us plan what we do, the fact of the matter is that we certainly can uh, look towards doing fully autonomous surgery. That may not be in our lifetime, but certainly something that we can actually do now. Augmented reality is another enabling technology, which I think is here to stay with Augmetics and other platforms. And the fact of the matter is we are getting better with software. So we're now able to take a CT scan and automatically plan pedicle screws. So screws are placed in the optimal position for biomechanics, for stress risers, and to line up the pedicle screws. Annotating uh, the spine automatically, something we can do now too. And then ultimately taking all of this together in the realm of art artificial intelligence, how do we predictively understand what patient needs what surgery, how we put this all together? I think uh, ultimately what you'll see is that as we get more data, we build these data sets, we'll have a much more uh, higher ability to predict who needs what surgery and when the right time to do that surgery is for any given patient. So I'd like to thank, uh, Everybody at Seattle Science Foundation for the opportunity to present today. I think uh, robotic surgery is here to stay and uh, certainly uh, wish I could be there in person and hope to see everybody soon. Talk to you later.